Hi everyone, my name is Matt Williams. I'm a politics tutor at the University of Oxford. I am also what's known as the Access Fellow of Jesus College. Access Fellow means that I'm responsible for making the university more accessible to people that have historically been underrepresented there. Today I want to talk about what you want and what specifically you may want to study at university level. This is an incredibly important decision because what you choose to study can shape the rest of your life. It can even shape how you perceive your own reality. So it is a remarkably important question and it's one I'm often asked. So we're talking about your decision algorithm, the way you establish the relevant facts to you in order to make a decision that will work for you and will bring the best out of you. And my key point in this is that choice about what you want and knowing what you want comes down to what we would call projection rather than prediction. Now a prediction is where you have almost certain knowledge that something will come to pass. So you predict, you etymologically speaking, foretell, hence pre and diction, what will happen. So the sun rose for the last n days, so I can predict that it will rise again tomorrow morning. A projection is where there's a much more sort of greater latitude for probability. So you might see something along the lines of, when the sun rises tomorrow, I project that my feelings will be of happiness because of its rising. When it comes to determining what you want for the future and therefore what you want to study, it is much more of a projection than a prediction, meaning that you have to expect a degree of probabilistic latitude. You cannot, to be blunt, know what you want. Okay, And therefore when it comes to working out an effective decision algorithm for deciding what you would like to study, you need to be comfortable with a degree of uncertainty. And you also need to think about what base fundamentals are important in making an effective decision. And to my mind, the most important factor that ought to be prioritised is happiness. Now let me just set the scene a little bit before we dive too much into some of the theory about how to elevate your happiness. First of all, we're talking about an, a paradox of choice as it's been described. Now a paradox of choice is where you have so many options available that it becomes cripplingly, cripplingly difficult to decide. There is just too many options and therefore ironically you can't choose. Now this is the case for the higher education market, certainly in the UK. According to the Universities and Colleges Admissions Service, UCAS, which administers admissions for universities like Oxford, there are 50,000 higher education degrees uh, in the United Kingdom alone, being provided by 395 providers. For the University of Oxford alone, we have 49 fundamental degree programmes, but because of all of the options, in particular with regards to modern and ancient languages, that can expand to well over 200 specific undergraduate degrees you can do. There are 350 graduate degree programmes you can do, and then there are degrees such as a doctorate, which you can also pursue. So there is a bewildering amount of choice, and we need to therefore think about an effective mechanism for determining which choices are most appropriate for us as individuals. Okay, so that's what I would like to consider today. Now I mentioned earlier that the most important priority ought to be happiness. Now that might sound like a slightly sort of hippy-dippy hedonistic approach to life, to just try and elevate your happiness as the core part of any decision algorithm, but actually it is backed up by an awful lot of contemporary science. Now time was that it was assumed and verified according to various research designs that First you had to obtain success before you would then feel the happiness, the positivity from having obtained that success. And success of course can be defined in a multitude of ways, but broadly speaking the causal direction was assumed to be success first, happiness later. But contemporary research has completely upended that causal pathway and has actually provided much more systematic and verified evidence that it is the other way around that happy people, or people who have what is sometimes described as positive affect, are more successful in whatever they choose to pursue. Now this is backed up by research published in very prestigious journals, including the American Psychological Association. There's a paper with well over 7,000 citations that I will link in the description so you can check it out if you don't believe me. But the key point is that this is not sort of some sort of namby-pamby snowflakery I'm talking about here. This is cold, hard, efficient science. If you want to make the most out of your life, you need to work out what makes you happy. Now, as I said earlier, you can't fully know what makes you happy. It's an epistemological black hole. 
in the sense that it is unknowable to know precisely what it does and what will ultimately make you happy. So this raises all sorts of questions about how we can come up with some sort of concrete mechanism for deciding what we may like to study and what we may like to do on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's try and break it down for a bit. First of all, what is happiness? That in itself is highly complex and has been discussed by philosophers since time in immemorial. But in a biological or neurophysiological sense, happiness is to do with the neurotransmitters that can be neatly summarized by the acronym DOSE, which are dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins. Now, when it comes to learning, and that thrill you sometimes get from finding out a fact or understanding a theory, that is typically dopamine at work. And what we're looking for is some sort of subject or set of subjects which yield that dopamine flush. Now, what scientists sometimes talk about is what's called supernormal stimuli. Now, these are the sorts of things like junk food and even pornography, where you hijack your brain's dopamine pathways and you get an enormous thrill because there's a sort of super concentrated stimulus. And certain subjects will achieve very similar degrees of elation from dopamine. And it's up to you to try and work out some of the fundamentals in the subjects that you're taking at school that you think might transfer into that sort of dopamine feedback, positive feedback in the future. Okay. And there are concrete ways of doing this, so don't worry, I'll get beyond the sort of the very theoretical to the practical shortly. Okay. Now, just a little bit of a history of dopamine. Dopamine was evolved by our mammalian ancestors in order to deal with the problem of scarcity. One of the most fundamental existential problems of all living beings has always been a scarcity of resources. So how do you, as an organism, continue to persevere in hunting for food when you've had days, maybe even weeks, of ha not having proper nourishment? How do you keep yourself motivated and going? Well, the motive neurotransmitter at work is typically dopamine. And so it's that which for our, say, caveman ancestors would have meant that they could have waited, let's say, a week, and then when a mammoth comes along and they, they get, a conf get a successful kill, they would have this massive flush of dopamine to then motivate them to try and do it again. And that's the sort of delayed gratification, that thrill, that stimulus that you want to try and seek out in your academic work because it will make you satisfied, but it'll also keep you going. And hence why happiness can lead to success, because once you've established a, a positive feedback between dopamine and your work, then your work no longer becomes alienating. You do the work because it's a thrill. You're not doing the work because someone else has demanded it of you. You're not doing it because you feel somehow duty bound to do it. You're doing it just for the sheer hedonistic thrill of it. Now that might seem slightly sort of unrealistic, this idea that writing an essay would be so giddying that you could do it without any sort of pain or unpleasantness. That is clearly unrealistic. But nonetheless, there are certain aspects to subjects that will give you a sense of just completion, a sense of real exuberance. Now, for me, that was always politics. But I just didn't quite identify it particularly early. So a common question I get is, when should I know, by when should I know what I would like to study? For me, it was pretty late in the day. I had to do a period of self-reflection to try and fully realise that it was politics that I loved. And when I realised what it was about politics that gave me that dopamine feedback, that's when I understood this is the subject I have to do at university and ultimately I've devoted my life to. The reason that I loved it, I, I found out for myself, was that it's just such a grubby soap opera. It's like the world's longest and most epically grotesque box set and I can't take my eyes off it. The way I describe it to my students is that it's a bit like Love Island with missiles. Love Island, for those of you watching abroad, is a pretty tawdry sort of British uh, reality TV show. Think Geordie Shaw. So I had this notion that it was this, this ridiculously grubby subject, but I found it sort of intoxicating to look at. And so that's what gave me that feedback loop. I'm sure there's something terribly wrong with me for thinking that way, but there it is, okay? So what you need to do, what's the, you know, what are the practical implications? What you need to do is do some homework, do some research, but let's be a bit more specific. First of all, I'd like to knock on the head any myths that you may have heard about subject choice at universities like Oxford. For a start, our website is absolutely gospel. In other words, anything you see on the website with regards to entry requirements, for particular degrees or anything you see about what would make for a, a, a competitive application that is inviolable okay because it's setting up a legitimate expectation 
if we then for then change that expectation we could be sued for it so for example when we say that all of our degrees require you to have three a levels if you're applying from the uk that is true right there's no subtext by which we sort of say yeah but if you've got four or five a levels you'll be a better candidate no if it says on the website you need three a levels that is all you need you also only need to get the grades that are specified you don't need to get vastly over those grades okay it is also clearly stated on our website with regard to a levels that there is only one uh, a level that we will not accept and that is general studies so again please push out of your mind some of the mythology you may have heard about oxford not being particularly happy about certain a-level choices maybe looking down or disdaining certain choices so i'm often asked can i do an a-level in drama can i do an a-level in art can i do an a-level of a-level in something that i love and will oxford think less of me for doing it no if it says on the website that you can have those a-levels you can have those a-levels okay there's no subtext there's no lying and if you find out somehow that we have been lying to you on the website, you can sue us because we've breached your legitimate expectations. Okay, very, very important. So do what you love, okay? There are, of course, certain subject requirements for certain degrees, things like for medicine, you have to have chemistry at A-level plus one other science, but that still gives you quite a lot of latitude. And you do not need to have four, five, six, seven A-levels in order to be a competitive medicine student, okay? The next practical step, once you've sort of realized the reality of what information is available and you trust that information on the website and you don't think that there's some sort of subtext going on the next two things that you need to do is to undergo a period of self-reflection to try and work out what makes you happy and to try and pursue that and then you need to think about doing some specific targeted research in pursuit of that self-reflection okay so with regards to the self-reflection think about the sort of forces that create your dopamine feedback returns they will be, broadly speaking, three components involved, nature, nurture, and self-construction. So nature is just the natural genetic endowments that you have. You will have certain dispositions towards finding interest in certain subjects. But it is important to note that our, our genetic hardware as human beings is remarkably similar. Some recent research done by Oxford University has shown that there are two troops of chimpanzees on either side of one river in Africa that are more genetically diverse than all of the human beings on Earth. The implication being that human beings are remarkably similar in their genetic makeup. And so this notion that you're somehow born being good at maths or born being good at law or anything else is not terribly likely. Okay, And it also, if you think about it carefully, you know, what does it mean to be good at maths? Well, maths entails a whole host of different skills. So this notion that there is a maths brain and a non-maths brain, I'm afraid is more mythology that needs to be tackled head on. And certainly some of the gendered assumptions around the, those subjects along the lines that women can't do mathematics is not verified. And in certain countries where they have had a long history of encouraging more women into the workforce, such as former communist countries in Central and Eastern Europe, there is much greater equality in degree programs like mathematics and physics and computer science. So this notion that women cannot do certain science degrees, I'm afraid, doesn't bear up to even the limpest scrutiny. Okay, so that's nature. Think about what you're naturally disposed to, but don't give it too much credence. Then there's nurture. You will have been socialized into certain interests by parents, by family, by teachers. Certain things will have been a thrill to you because people have encouraged that thrill in you. Again, be careful because of course sometimes people may be putting pressure on you to enjoy a subject that you frankly don't enjoy. We often see this for example with regards to medicine, that some people are, are encouraged towards medicine because of its prestige, even if they're not necessarily that interested in the subject. So make sure that you acknowledge what the socialization has done to you and that you're clear that it's nonetheless enjoyable for you. It's absolutely fine if you have been sort of encouraged by teachers, by family to, to think of subjects like medicine as enjoyable and you actually enjoy them. Great, good for you. But just be sure that you are authentically getting that dopamine return. You're not doing, you're not servicing someone else's neurotransmitters, you're servicing your own, okay? And the third point is self-construction, that what we enjoy is capable of augmentation. We can change it. You can develop an interest after all. And you can think about the skills you have and you can think about how you've been socialized and you can augment those into new interests, things that you've never studied, things you've never considered before, okay? So you can become exploratory, you can find out new things and you can expand your interests, okay? So 
what should you practically do? I would suggest if you want to work out what subjects you should do whilst you're at school and what subjects you should do at university, start by testing some fairly clear hypotheses. Start with just trusting your gut and thinking, well, I particularly like at the moment studying, let's say, English literature. So I would like to test the hypothesis that I would like to study this at university level. And to test that hypothesis, you go and do research into what an English literature degree entails, how it's taught, what sort of modules are covered, and you look into all of the detail to test that hypothesis. After maybe an hour's research, if you're starting to think, actually, I'm not sure this hypothesis is bearing under the weight of my researches, then you can briefly move it aside and start with a new hypothesis. And that could be along the lines of, well, I enjoy studying literature, but I think I'd like to think about it in a fresh context. So maybe I'd be happier thinking about the literature of a foreign country. So maybe I'd like to study a language such as Arabic or Japanese, where I could get the benefits of enjoying literature, but also dip my toes into the waters of history and politics and culture and of course language. So be open-minded, look at the wide range of subjects. Bear in mind that universities will have subjects that you will never have studied before. And so you need to have a good hard think about whether or not those subjects would be even more likely to provide you with a wonderful dopamine rush than the things that you're currently studying. So for example, I'm a tutor in the degree program of philosophy, politics, and economics known as PPE. Most of my students have never studied PP or E ever in their lives. And that's not a problem, but they have studied cognate disciplines, in other words, subjects that are very similar, and they've got this sense that PPE combines all of those fantastic ideas and things that give them a thrill, but in a package they've never formally studied before, but they have considered, okay? So nice systematic research. You've done a period of self-reflection, you worked out what your nature, your nurture, and your, your own self-construction have, have made as dopamine pathways for you. And then you've tested some specific hypotheses as to what that means for what you'd like to study in the future. That's the way to do it, nice and systematic and clear. Otherwise, what might happen is that you just sort of are confronted by the paradox of choice. You're confronted by this myriad of options and you just don't know where to start. And you just are gripped by the problem of not being able to even make that first step, okay? So nice, clear, guidance is what you need and targeted research and at all times think about what makes you happy because happiness yields success this is not hippy dippy nonsense this is proper science okay it will make you more successful and frankly the students that we tend to admit to Oxford are the ones that are the most motivated the ones that love their subject the ones that live and breathe it the sort of people that would happily read books on their given subject on a national holiday like Christmas Day. Okay, that's the sort of joy that we look for because those people will go much further, much deeper into the subjects than someone who's doing it for much more intrinsic reasons, in other, uh, sorry, much more instrumental reasons, in other words, that they're doing it because they want a specific career trajectory, but they don't really enjoy the job. Okay, so I hope that makes it clear. I hope this is actually quite encouraging because ultimately I'm telling you, for goodness sake, go and have some fun because if you're having fun, you'll be doing well. All right, thank you so much for watching. As ever, get in touch if you have any questions. Uh, I am matthew.williams at jesus.ox.ac.uk. If I can help you at all, I will. Thank you so much for watching. Take care of yourselves. All the best. Bye.